just me, or is it kind of creepy that evolutionists say we're made up of spare parts? No, that's just you. Otherwise, nobody says that. Working on your car? I can't hear you. Can you shut it off? I can't hear you because the car's on. What's in the box? Oh, you know, my car's leftover parts. I always have a few of them left over when I'm done working on it. Parts you don't need? Pretty sure. Are you, are you sure you don't need these? Or you know this? Not really, but I started the engine and it runs without this junk. You know, all this reminds me about what our textbook says about vestigial structures. Can you help me grab it out of my backpack? Mm. How do you not know what's in your car? <laughs> uh, something wrong? <laughs> no, 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 but <clears throat> why don't you look it up for us? Oh, yeah, right, okay. Where's it? Oh, there it is right there. Vestigial structures are inherited from ancestors, but have lost much or all of their original function due to different selection pressures acting on the descendant. So they're saying that animals and people have leftovers in their bodies that once served a function in our evolutionary ancestors? <laughs> hey, just like the parts for my car. Exactly, the example they give here is the dolphin's hip bones. They're saying its ancestor used to walk on land, but once the dolphin evolved to live in water, it has useless leftover hip bones. You kids really need to work on your reading comprehension and retention, because what Jane just read is not what stayed in her head. She selectively forgot a couple bits, so let's go back over them. While there does appear to be an urban myth that vestigial structures must be completely useless, that's not what the term means or ever meant, and that's not what the textbook said either. Instead, it says that vestigial structures are inherited from ancestors, but have lost much or all of their original function. So it can still have a function. It can still have the original function if it is in a diminished capacity. And that is the true biological definition, and we can confirm that from other academic sources as well. Thus, this one error, misdefining vestigial as including only those things with absolutely no function whatsoever, reduces John's and Jane's entire skit to nothing more than a straw man fallacy, arguing against a false argument, something evolution doesn't even teach. A vestige is a remnant or remainder of what was once larger, more developed, and more important than it is now. Examples of this in humans would include our canine teeth, which are significantly reduced and cannot serve the original function, which in other hominin species is for sexual display and competition among males, which nowadays only happens in movies. And before that, our earlier ancestors, since at least the time of the Cynodonts, used their fangs for stabbing prey. But our pathetic canines can't perform that function either. But we can still use them for chewing, which amusingly, our ancestors could not do. And likewise, our flat fingernails, which are a diagnostic feature of monkeys, are themselves the remnants of curved claws. And we can still scratch with them, but we cannot slash with them because they're so diminished as to be virtually useless in combat. So we find other purposes for them. We can use them for cleaning grit or for dermatology because they can work as tweezers, but that's not the original function. What's funny is scientists recently discovered that marine animals, like whales, need these bones during mating season. Well, that would explain why the pelvis can be seen shrinking, getting progressively smaller and weaker over a sequence of fossil forms, but that it hasn't disappeared altogether. You're going to use whatever you've got however you can, and just about any tool can be repurposed as a weapon if need be, and probably everything in your junk drawer can be used for something, even if it's not at all what you bought it for. The study was published in a 2014 article in the science journal, Evolution. Wait, wait, wait. The name of the journal is Evolution. Yep. The one that claims they've discovered a purpose for these bones, which goes against the whole idea that these bones are mere evolutionary leftovers. That there's the definition of irony, isn't it? There is no irony in the fact that religious extremists, science denialists, selectively read only the comfortable parts of their scriptures, and that they similarly cite only the out-of-context quotations from scientists or certain surgically selected sections of sentences they agree with in textbooks, so that they can use these deceptively misquoted extractions to misrepresent the rest. But if you're going to cite a peer-reviewed publication, you really ought to read it first. 
The article Jane is referring to said that it should be noted that some cetacean species retain internal vestiges of femora and or tibia. Uh, those are hind leg bones in whales that don't have hind legs. And when they have these bones, they don't play any part in reproduction. So they really are completely useless. And we also know that fetal whales develop hind leg buds that are then reabsorbed back into the developing body following an evolutionary pattern, a pattern that only makes sense in light of evolution and which creationism cannot explain. But these vestigial legs are not always reabsorbed because the study also said that in extremely rare cases, individuals develop external hind limbs. And these are known as atavisms where a recent evolutionary stage might be enabled again, even though these structures are usually functionless because they may not have any of the supportive skeletal apparatus. Humans have atavisms too, and there are a few examples of this, like the palmaris longus muscle that, in other primates, significantly strengthens their grip while climbing through the trees. Only a small percentage of people have this muscle, and when they do, it is not as strong as it is in other primates. So, in the textbook, they call them useless, but in reality, these bones help the dolphin reproduce and survive. Exactly. No, not exactly. The textbook didn't say it was useless. It said that only the primary function was lost and that it had little or no function now, allowing that it could have some function, but at best only a diminished capacity for the original or primary function. The pelvis of modern cetaceans, unlike that of their fossil precursors, is no good for walking anymore at all, is it? But it's the pelvic thrust. Okay, so there's something else you can do with your pelvis. But finding or maintaining a secondary function doesn't really matter. We still have ample evidence that the cetacean pelvis really is a greatly reduced vestige of what it once was, and that it can no longer be used for its original primary function, which some of its many fossil ancestors could still do. But the reason the cetacean pelvis didn't disappear completely is because it can still be used for a secondary function, in this case as a brace or anchor point for reproductive muscles. And the study also says that some cetaceans have already replaced the anchor point of bone with that of cartilage. So in that lineage at least, that bone can completely disappear now and not leave the animal disabled. Though I'm sorry to say that it will never walk again. And they say the same thing about humans. That we have dolphin hips? Not exactly, but close. They point out that our coccyx, the tailbone, is left over from when we had tails. They think we used to have tails? Yeah, but it's just the end of our backbone. I mean, it has to end somewhere, right? True. John, how can you pretend to refute such a well-supported theory as evolution when you don't know anything at all about it? Yes, we had tails for most of our evolutionary history. At first, they were used for swimming. Then later, the best we could do with them was to smack things occasionally. And the size of the tail had to be reduced when we became homeothermic, because heating such a large tail is an inefficient waste of resources, and evolution has economy. Although the smaller tails later proved to be helpful keeping balance in the trees. But when you get a little bigger, then the tails aren't that helpful, really. So we only lost them about the time we became apes. It's also the anchor for a bunch of muscles, right? Yes. Tiny muscles, tendons, and ligaments connect to it, and it supports something called the pelvic diaphragm. This whole system holds a bunch of muscles and organs in place, like the bladder. Which is why the tail didn't disappear completely. It shortened down as much as it could. It had to end somewhere, right? Now, if we had been intelligently designed, then there wouldn't even be the base of a tail here. Instead, all of these connections would be integrated to a much better designed pelvis that didn't have that weak spot that is so susceptible to injury. I know someone that broke their tailbone in childhood and has suffered the effects of that for the rest of their lives. So what other things did they say are leftovers? The tonsils. Of course. Lots of people had their tonsils removed. Great way to get ice cream for dinner. Do you seriously let them cut out your tonsils just so you can have ice cream? Well, it depends on what kind of ice cream we're talking about here. Okay, not really. But people survive just fine without tonsils, right? Uh, studies now show that in some cases, removing your tonsils can be worse in the long run, and especially for young children. I woke up during my tonsillectomy when I was five years old in 1968. I remember the doctor scrambling to put an anesthesia mask on me. So what's their purpose? Tonsils are placed at the back of the throat so they trap germs when we breathe. 
Proteins called antibodies produced by immune cells in the tonsils help kill germs and prevent throat and lung infections. They actually manufacture antibodies against disease. They're basically the first line of defense against inhaled or ingested viruses. Doesn't Jane realize that the germ theory of disease that she's quoting here is just a theory? Hello everyone, Jackson Wheat here again. There are several things that stick out to me about this tonsil argument. First, as Aaron already pointed out, the literal textbook definition given by Jane said that, quote, vestigial structures are inherited from ancestors but have lost much or all of their original function due to different selection pressures acting on the descendant, close quote. Per that definition, tonsils don't have to be functionless to be considered vestigial. And it's weird that both John and Jane keep pretending like they didn't just give a definition that said that. Second, Jane's comment about tonsillectomies sometimes being worse for the patient is true of practically any surgery, and so doesn't constitute an actual argument, especially since some 800,000 Americans have theirs removed per year. I happen to know people who would have died had they not had their tonsils removed. The same goes for me with my appendectomy a few years back. Intelligent design indeed. Third, R.J. Downer and I probed the tonsil issue in our book The Rocks Were There, Volume 1. It seems that creationists were likely the ones who invented the claim of vestigiality in this case. John and Jane are referencing a list of 86 claimed vestigial organs that was put together in 1893 by German anatomist Robert Weidersheim. However, John and Jane aren't doing this directly. Unsurprisingly, they're making the exact same mistakes as Answers in Genesis writer David Minton from his article Vestigial Organs, Evidence for Evolution, which I doubt is a coincidence. For example, Jane asserts that evolutionists think tonsils are just functionless leftovers as Minton did in his article. Minton states that Weidersheim included tonsils as functionless vestiges, but neither Weidersheim's original or later list included tonsils at all. In fact, concerning the thymus, Weidersheim wrote that it was known among, quote, the lower fishes in which it attains the greatest development, close quote, which work had, quote, led to the brilliant suggestion that it may be in them primarily protective of the branchial organs of respiration by a process of phagocytosis in a manner akin to that in which the tonsils and associated cytogenous tissues are protective of the main respiratory passages of the pulmonary organs of the terrestrial vertebrata." Close quote. That doesn't sound much like Weidersheim thought the tonsils lacked a function, does it? To close here, the tonsils weren't considered vestigial by Weidersheim, but were claimed by creationists. Even if tonsils are vestigial, that doesn't mean they're functionless, as Jane pointed out in her definition earlier. No part of her argument is valid. So. Thanks again for having me on, Aaron. So what about the appendix? It's thought to be vestigial, right? I'm not even sure I know what it is. The appendix is a little spindly bit attached to the large intestine, and it does look like a remnant shriveling up to eventually disappear altogether. And sometimes it causes a problem in becoming painfully inflamed to the point that it might kill you. And this has been and still is associated with its inactivity. And Darwin also knew that only certain herbivorous mammals had this feature, so he hypothesized that the human appendix might be the evolutionary remains of a structure called a cecum, which is larger in basal primates and thus, theoretically, in our extinct ancestors also. And this would have helped our predecessors ingest tougher, more infectious foods. And Darwin thought that the organ fell into disuse once we started cooking most foods, and subsequent studies for more than a century fell in line with that hypothesis which is why the textbooks read as they did. It's a tube-shaped sac attached to the lower end of the large intestine. It's part of your digestive system, and okay, enough it... Said. But they also have purpose? We now know that rather than being a vestige of the cecum, the appendix has evolved multiple times, once in Australian metatherians, marsupials, and again separately in liars, rodents, lagomorphs, and basal primates too, which is why we have them. In fact, 70% of primate and rodent families have this feature, including some that still have a robust cecum, and the appendix grows out of that. Darwin couldn't have known about that in 1859. If he did, he wouldn't have posed his hypothesis. 
Yes, it's the storehouse for beneficial bacteria. When you fight an intestinal disease, your body gets rid of bacteria, both good and bad. But then the appendix can quickly resupply your system with good bacteria. Sounds pretty helpful. Yep. It also plays a role in our body's immune system, especially when we're younger. Sounds pretty important. Biologists like William Parker of Duke University now theorize that this loss of function, which is linked to appendicitis, more likely results from drinking purified water from sanitary sewage treatment. And more importantly, he has also recently indicated what may be a primary function. You see, the majority of your cells in your body are not your own. You are mostly bacteria, a symbiont whose survival depends on the microbes living in your digestive tract. Some diseases, like dysentery or cholera, may flush the system, leaving us in a compromised state, in which case the appendix serves as a bacterial nursery to replenish the flora in your gut. And now scientists believe there are peripheral functions, too, that Darwin couldn't have known about, a small part of mucosal immune functions and so on. I don't like to say that scientists believe something, because some people take that to mean that they merely assumed that for no good reason, when we know that every scientific position must be based on supportive evidence. It's not like scientists are chanting the mantras that we believe this thing about the appendix and you too must swear to believe this thing about the appendix. No. Science is completely opposite of that, where blasphemy and heresy against the status quo are the way to challenge and correct bad science. So instead of saying that the scientists believe, let's say the scientists now suspect. Charles Darwin thought vestigial structures were a winning argument for evolution. And he believed there were lots of vestigial structures? Yeah, and a German anatomist by the name of Robert Wiedersheim made a list of 86 vestigial structures in the human body. And later, evolutionists expanded the list to about 180. But modern science has now shown that every one of them has a purpose. That's not true. Whenever a creationist says that this or that study says X, go find that study. Read it for yourself and you'll usually see that it doesn't say that at all. Or you might find that that one sentence is there, but that the implication is not because it's contradicted by the context. A few of these structures may serve a function, but most of them don't. You see, I can find Weidersheim's original document of vestigial traits, and I can even find later articles expanding that list from 86 to 180, and I can find separate articles to where one or two of those traits may have turned out to have a primary function after all. But if Wittershem's original list, the entirety of it, turned out to have full capacity of original function, then that would have been compiled into a single document. And whoever wrote the script for John and Jane would have referred to that. They certainly would have if it was the whole list of 180 vestiges that had all been so confirmed like Jane just said. But John and Jane didn't refer to any such document because there isn't one because the vast majority of those traits really are diminished or disabled or repurposed vestiges. But the apologist can't admit that, so the writer of John and Jane's script did what they've done in this episode and in every other episode of this series so far. Lie. So, they didn't know about these organs' functions in the body? No, they assumed that since people could survive without them, that these were totally useless. No, that's still wrong. That's not what vestigial means, at least not necessarily. Though it can include features that are completely useless, and we humans do have some traits like that. For example, only some of us still have the muscles necessary to move our ears, and those of us who do have that feature have it greatly reduced from what it is in monkeys and more primitive mammals. That trait used to be useful to triangulate where a noise was coming from, but we just don't have that capacity anymore. So even if you can move your ears at all, no one can do it well enough to be useful. Then they reasoned in a circle, arguing that since they were useless leftovers of an evolutionary past, they demonstrate our evolutionary past. It is not circular reasoning to form a hypothesis that accounts for all the data without having to ignore inconvenient truths like John and Jane are determined to do. For example, most other vertebrates have a nictitating membrane or third eyelid. Amphibians have it. Reptiles have it, including birds, and a lot of mammals have it too, from the most primitive monotremes and metatherians, even some eutherians, placental mammals, still have it, but not all of them. Those mammals that don't have this feature or don't have the fully functioning version of it have instead just a remnant of it, called the pleca semilunaris, that little pink glob on the inside corner of your eyes. That little glob has a function. It keeps your eyelids sufficiently wet, if you move your eyes around and blink a lot. 
But if we still had a nictating membrane, well, that would do the blinking for us, and it would work as a kind of windshield wiper. We don't need that anymore because we can make up for it with these other movements. But the point is that following the evidence is not circular reasoning. So reasoning in a circle is bad. Uh, yeah, it's when we assume our conclusion, then use that assumption to prove our conclusion. It's crazy. John and Jane should work in the cinema because if there's one thing they're good at, it's projection. The perfect example of circular reasoning is the assumption that the Bible is the Word of God. And you believe that because the Bible says so. And you believe what the Bible says because you believe the Bible is infallible. And you assume that it is infallible because you've already assumed that the Bible is the Word of God. When really, the Bible is just one of several supposedly sacred scriptures penned by men pretending to speak for their various gods or versions of God. Look how many prophets claim to hear God talk to them directly. Do you believe all of them? If not, why not? And how could we believe in any of them? So what do modern evolutionists say about these organs, now that science has discovered that every one of them have functions after all? They now claim that vestigial organs can have functions after all, and those functions may have evolved after the organ spent time being useless. Wow, talk about imagination. Wow, talk about projection and deception, because that's not what scientists just started saying now. That's what they've been saying to start with. The word vestigial first appeared and was defined in 1893 when Robert Wiedersheim published his anatomy book, The Structure of Man, listing 86 structures as organs having become wholly or in part functionless, some appearing in the embryo alone, others present during life constantly or inconstantly. For the greater part, organs which may rightly be termed vestigial. From its inception with this definition, the word never meant functionless. It's kind of sad that they think we're made up of useless parts, instead of acknowledging the design by Jesus the Creator. Well, Jesus isn't the Creator. Even in Christian theology, the Creator is God the Father, Yahweh or Yehovah. Jesus would be God the Son, like the Redeemer, if we were to compare the Christian Trinity to the Hindu Trimurti. You know, there's been this move in evangelical Christianity that I really wasn't aware of back when I was an evangelical. People saying that Jesus himself is Yahweh, uh, which I think is bonkers. I mean, just, I mean, not, not theologically bonkers. I mean, I'm not taking a religious stand. I mean, I'm not a believer at all. But I think historically, that's just nuts. I mean, I, there's no way that the early Christians thought that Jesus was Yahweh. They thought that he was the son of God. Um, and that, that, I mean, Yahweh's the one who, I mean, no. <laughs> but point in fact, we don't think that we're made of useless parts. It's just that John and Jane can't get anything right. It kind of reminds me of Psalm 139, 14. Yeah, yeah, it says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. What better way to refute space-age science than with Iron Age poetry? Written by superstitious primitives who believed in witches and curses, incantation and sorcery, who thought that the planets were conscious beings, that diseases were caused by demons, that dust devils were literally devils, and that volcanoes were angry gods. God has a purpose for everything, even if we aren't sure of what it is. The purpose of God is to manipulate the masses by making people think that there's an inescapable despot who sees everything that they do and tells on them, talking directly to prophets and kings who are commanding these people and enforcing the laws of men and extorting 10% of everyone's income in order to enrich themselves. I guess that could be true of my leftover box of parts, huh? Uh, yeah. By the way, this is the air cleaner that filters air going to the engine, the EGR valve regulates exhaust, and the EVAP canister prevents gas from leaking into the atmosphere. Whoa, you know about all this stuff? My dad's a mechanic. Okay, well, um, can you show me where they go? Uh, sure. All right, one last thought. The fact that evolutionists can't find any useless organs really destroys the idea that we're made up of spare parts. Yeah, kind of makes you think, doesn't it? Yeah, since we have found plenty of useless vestiges and we still don't think that we're just made of spare parts, it does make me think that John and Jane have no idea what they're talking about. They make me think that the scriptwriter wants to misrepresent all the facts so that it looks like they have a case, when all they really have is a deliberately cultured misunderstanding where they're trying to misunderstand reality so that they can make believe in their favorite fantasy. 
let me counter all of that and correct this notion about us being made of spare parts. Some of the earliest fish of the Ordovician period 485 million years ago had only dorsal or caudal fins. The first ones to develop even a sliver of a pectoral fin enjoyed a huge selective advantage given the vast improvement in swimming. So that trait was inherited by every major chordate lineage since then. Now fast forward 125 million years or so and some of those primitive fish have their fins mounted on short limbs, including some species with toes and ankles, knee and elbow joints, so their fins were repurposed into legs. Now fast forward another 140 million years and some archosaurs, including the earliest dinosaurs, have become bipedal. Thus, their front legs have been repurposed as grasping arms. The earliest dinosaurs still had five fingers, but soon they were reduced to three. As 70 million years or so later, and a lot of these dinosaurs were also sporting wing feathers, which were not only colorful displays in sexual courtship or in self-defense, but they were also capable of insulating a larger clutch of eggs. Eventually, of course, some of the smaller dinosaurs figured out how to repurpose their arms as wings, becoming birds. Now, when the asteroid hit that ended the Mesozoic era, some of the birds survived, mostly because they could fly and they didn't require quite as much food as the other dinosaurs did. However, there were a couple groups of birds that had given up flight when there were no giant predators around anymore. And one of these groups is typified by the emu, whose arm no longer qualifies as a wing. It still retains a claw, and that one claw and that one finger is on an arm that has no musculature anymore. If you want to see a totally useless vestige, what good is a sickle-shaped claw on an arm that cannot move, and that is so emaciated and withered that you can't even see it under its weird feathers. And there was another group of flightless birds in New Zealand who made their living by swimming and fishing underwater. They evolved into penguins, having repurposed their wings into flippers. Different from fins, but technically they are again used for the same original purpose. Yet they are still vestigial, being unable to be used as wings or arms or legs anymore but your arms are not spare parts because they still perform all the original primary, secondary, and tertiary functions they ever did.